Hi, my name is Catherine Walters, also known as The Knitted Raven. Welcome back to my channel. Here on my channel, you'll find jewelry making tips, tricks, and tutorials to help you make beautiful and decorative items for yourself and for your home. Um, today, I promise to show you how to set a cabochon with Viking wire knitting. I realized as I started planning for this video that there are a number of considerations and actually steps in the process. So I'm going to break it down into parts and I might even upload them separately because in my neck of the woods, it can take 14 hours to upload a 20 minute video. Mm -hmm, that's our high speed internet here. Anyway, I digress. The first consideration is your cabochon. And when you're using Viking wire knitting, uh, some cabochons are actually better than others to use. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Then I'm going to talk to you about how to make a frame because Viking wire knitting needs a frame to be cast onto. And then the final part will be about the actual knitting and setting the stone. Anyway, uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to this channel. And if you like this series of videos, please give it a thumbs up. It helps my channel grow. And without further ado, let's get down to it. Okay, I'm doing laundry, and unfortunately this camera is not that far from my laundry machine, so I'm going to try this as a take and see if it works. Welcome to part one of how to set a cabochon with Viking style wire knitting. And I said the first consideration we need to talk about today is cabochons. Not all cabochons are created equal. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what I mean. One of the things I, I learned uh, when I started wrapping cabochons in Viking wire knitting pretty quickly was that round shapes and teardrop shapes are actually two of the easiest uh, shapes to make a frame for. Uh, when we get into making the frame, um, I'll probably talk a little bit more about that. But with a round shape, it's a, a little more forgiving. And uh, because of the symmetry of the shape, it's easier to keep an eye on whether your knitting is pulling uh, in one direction or another. The other consideration when um, uh, doing this is you want a cabochon that's fairly even. And sometimes that can be a challenge, um, especially uh, with larger cabochons. Um, I'll show you what I mean here. This, um, this one here, I can't remember what that stone is called, and unfortunately I didn't label it. But when I got it, the first thing I do is I take them out and I have a look at them. And I size them up from various angles. And the reason for that is, is you want the surface to be as level as possible and for the edges to be as uniform as possible. In a cabochon this size, and sometimes with a marquee's cut, you'll get one side that's higher than the other. And while you don't notice that with some types of wire knitting, or should say wire wrapping, with wire knitting, uh, it's going to look lopsided. So you want to keep that in mind. Also, uh, while this one is fairly even, um, it's not very thick. And um, I have a preference for cabochons that are a little bit thicker because it shows off the knitting. And the, this piece of jewelry is not supposed to be so much about the stone as it is about the knitting. And uh, so that's the reason why this lovely stone has yet to be wrapped because every time I pick it up, I go, mm, you're gonna be kind of pathetic looking because it's only gonna take a couple of rows to actually fit you in there, but I might still do it. I'm going to show you um, how to wrap one of these uh, little puppies here, and it'll probably be this one, and I'll explain why. This one is larger, and one of the mistakes that I made first when I started wrapping was I spaced my stitches out as far as possible. And I see this a lot on videos um, that I see online, because mine certainly won't be the only video out there showing how to do this. But what I find is when the knitting is spread out, it doesn't look as attractive. A nice, neat, fairly dense um, fabric of knitting makes for a much more attractive uh, frame. So in the interest of completing the first project in a timely manner, I'm going to suggest that you work with a stone that's, according to this, it's about th th three centimeters, so a little over an inch. And this one I think is closer to, to an inch. Now, I purposely brought out a stone with reflective qualities. This is a piece of Labradorite on purpose. Um, one of the considerations when you are wrapping a piece of Labradorite or any stone that's got some kind of a reflective quality to it, 
Uh, Peter's Eye is another thing that, um, another stone where you had to take this into consideration. Even though the picture might look nice, there it is, all reflective and flat, that's not how it's going to be worn. It's going to be worn perpendicular. So I always hold my stones up uh, in the light perpendicular as they will be hanging and then decide on the best orientation. Now the beauty with a round one is you can adjust it in the frame. Um, when you've got um, an asymmetrical shape like a teardrop, you don't have that option. You're either going to hang it up and down with the point um, pointing down or the point pointing up. That's the only two options you really have. Um, with ovals, ovals are also pretty good, but again, um, they tend to have a top and a bottom. I, I do set some on the side of the oval from time to time, but that's a little more challenging to make the frame. But with practice, you can certainly master it. But anyway, just a couple of considerations. So the winner uh, for today's tutorial is going to be this fossilized coral, which I think is quite lovely and should look lovely wrapped in either um, bronze or copper. Haven't yet decided that. Anyway, a few things for you to keep in mind when you're shopping for cabochons. Round is good starting out. You want something with a little bit of thickness to it compared to the overall size. And you don't want anything too large for your first run at this. Um, wire knitting is time consuming and I know that myself. I respond better when I get quick results when I'm trying something new and I hope you feel that way too. Anyway, part two will be about making the frame. Stay tuned. Catherine Walters here and welcome back to the studio in the hallway. Um, I have cut a piece of bronze wire here, 18 gauge, what, maybe 11 inches long. And that's just because a bronze wire is kind of springy and um, I don't want to uh, poke the camera while I'm doing this. You can work off the spool if you choose. I'm using 18 gauge bronze, sorry, um, not brass, bronze, because um, bronze is a bit stiffer. So if you're using copper, you might want to use a 16 gauge copper. Um, I often use my ring mandrel for helping me uh, get the shape of a small stone like this, because conveniently, have a look at this. Hmm. Yes, if I use close to the end of the uh, mandrel, say maybe at a 12, I'll get close to the um, interior uh, diameter that I want. And that's something I wanted to point out to you quickly. Your frame doesn't actually go around the outer edges, it goes just inside the edges because the very first uh, row of stitches is probably going to uh, cross over the edge of the stone. And um, that's important because the wire knitting will hold the stone to the frame. So keep that in mind. So I'm going to take my ring mandrel and I'm going to mark about halfway, judge about a halfway point in my wire, go to a 13 and just put a little bend in it. Give myself a wee curve. See if I'm coming in pretty good. And I think I am. So I'm going to go back to that 13 and I'm going to bring one wire around that way and one wire around that way. So I've got something that looks like this. Ooh, I might be a little big. I'm gonna go back to 12 and a half. Holding it at the 12 and a half. Actually, I might even go 12 and a quarter. And push with my fingers to compress that down. And you end up with something that looks like this. As you can see, you want to be just inside. The next thing you need to do is you need to take um, some square nose pliers and you're going to need a sharpie marker. I'm going to use my little one. I'm going to go back to my ring mandrel and I think I'm going to shrink that down just a little bit more to maybe a 12. Sorry. New setup, new camera angle. Lots of fun. Now, it's going to be easier to make adjustments if you're using copper. There's a lot more spring to this. But you'll notice where the wires are crossing there now. Maybe if I pull it in just a little bit more, following the curvature, I need to make a mark 
about where they cross over and a little one on the other side. Now what I'm going to do next, now that I got the basic shape, is I want to bend this up because I'm going to need to secure these wires. And first I have to see where I put my mark. I don't think it stayed. I may have wiped it off before it dried. That's pathetic. Okay, we're going to I'm going to go this one a little on the blind side. But you take it like this and you bend it straight up. So you have something that looks like that. And you go back and you check. And straighten that up. I may have bent that a little too far because ultimately you want the two ends to come straight up from the center bottom of your um from the center bottom of your circle. So now I'm going to flip this over. I'm going to come in with the pliers just to the other side. Now don't worry if these wires are a little bit wonky because we can straighten those out afterwards. What we're most concerned about right now is our overall shape. And there you have it. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to straighten this out a little bit with my nylon jaw pliers. And you'll notice I keep my thumb against the bend when I pull, and that helps me uh, not pull my bend out entirely. Yeah, going back in again. That's pretty darn good. I'm going to go back in on my mandrel again. Making frames is fiddly work, I'm just saying. And um, this is worth being patient about because a decent frame means you'll get decent results. That looks pretty good. Might even be a little bit big. So if that happens, just go in and unbend one of your wires. And then go back down below where you did that before and bend it again. Going back on my mandrel. Yeah, I think I like that a bit better. Now I just need to straighten these up so they're more likely to bend and meet where I want them to. Pull that one out. It really is a finagly process, but if you've got a good frame, you stand a much better chance of having a pendant that you're going to be pleased with. So, you want something that looks like that. I'm happy with that. The next thing that we're going to do now is um, decide what kind of a bale we want to make. Um, I'm going to show you what I normally do, but you do have options here, so stay tuned for that. So now the next thing we have to do is to set that curve. And if you've been following along with my videos, you know that involves hammering. So I've moved to a slightly sturdier table, but I'm going to stop talking now because the sound of the hammer is going to drown everything out. You just want to take your chasing hammer and gently tap around the curve holding the pieces together, the ends together, like you see me doing here. And watch out you don't hit your finger. Now that's the other reason why you don't want to have your frame right up to the edge, is because tapping like that does make the wire grow a bit. Now I'm going to hit it with the plastic mallet. also gave the ends there where I'm likely to form the bale a little a smack too. Now with uh, copper you might want to do that for a little bit longer but um, yeah you want to make sure that it's it's stiff enough that it doesn't easily get pulled out of shape. But um, a chasing hammer and a plastic mallet will do the job here. See you back at the workstation. 
Okay, I promised I'd show you a couple of ways to make your frame. Once you've got the circular shape, you have the ab ability to make uh, this as like a very large wire wrap loop. So if you want to go that route, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stick the mandrel. The mandrel is long, so this could get a little bit awkward. Let me adjust the camera angle here. Up we go. All right. Hopefully I can keep this in frame now and not poke it. You uh, seem like I'm poking you in the eye with the mandrel. Anyway, if you want to make the wire wrapped loop uh, approach, then you would start with something like this and I would hold it on the mandrel while you're doing this. And one of the, the pieces that the top piece that you um, originally bent up, so you had a pair needs to come across because we need to make that nice 90 degree angle like we've had before. You can see what I'm doing there. Um, I'm also going to cut some of this off because I really don't need this much. Again, this is more for demonstration purposes. And holding it tight to the uh, mandrel, do a turn or two. Or three. And the first thing I'm going to do now is come in and tuck that together. Show me those pliers just to make that wrap a little bit tighter, okay? And three wraps is probably good, so I'm going to cut that off on the back with my flush cutters, and I'm gonna tuck that end in. There we go. Now, going back to the mandrel again, because it comes in handy, You'll notice that these two wires are a little bit out of skew. Take your nylon jaw pliers and give it a nip, almost twisting it back a little bit. And now I've got those straightened up, see? And of course, to make a wire wrapped loop from here, we just need to, using the tips of our pliers, go down like that. And I can certainly cut off some of this because I got way more wire than I need. Don't know what I was thinking there. With either your round nose pliers or if you've got wrap and taps like I do, you can use those. And I just want to start making a loop. And I still have more wire than I need. Would you come in like this and want to make that a little bit tighter. Trimming off a little bit more. And you want to fandangle this just a little bit until you have all those fails. Use your trusty square nose pliers and close the puppy like a junk ring because you want a nice little teardrop shape there now to match what you got going on the top so that's a simple frame for um, a cabochon and all you need to do once you're finished knitting is to put a couple of jump rings through there and you've got it, it's ready to be suspended so that's one way to do this the second way to make a frame um, for Viking wire knitting or setting a cabochon of Viking wire knitting is to um, uh, use some uh, wire weaving to secure the two ends coming up. I'm actually going to show you how I make the bale that I typically do. So let's um, let's lower the camera and see if I can't give you some close-ups as to how this works. Now what I typically do is I take one of my ends that I stick off or that stick out the the to the right here, and I tip it like that. It just makes it a little easier for doing the wire weaving. Now, what I do is just holding it, holding the wire near the, the base where the two wires meet. I wrap, I wrap around twice, then I go in between. I come up around the top once, twice, then I go down in between. And wrap the bottom twice and then I come up in between and wrap the top twice 
careful not to get that in the way. And then down on the bottom, I think it's time to secure that end, get it out of the way. I don't do that right away because you do a little pulling on this. And if you do three three nice wraps and then tug hard while you're trying to get your, uh, your weaving tightened up there, you're going to pull it right off the wire. So don't cut it off and don't secure it right away. Hold it in place with your fingers. So let's see. Yep, two at the top. Now I come around, up and around the bottom twice. I'm in between. I come up from the back on the top wire. And I just keep repeating that process. I'm using a 28 gauge bronze wire here because bronze wire is stiffer and this is a small pendant. Um, uh, with copper, I could probably get away with a 26 gauge, which is a little bit bigger for starting out. But I'm quite partial to, um, I like a nice fine knit on a, on a cabochon. So there you can see the weaving. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to continue weaving until I get up to about here. Because what I want is to weave these two together so they're like a common or a single bale wire. Even though I'm working with two wires here. And I'll show you what we're going to do in a minute. Anyway, keep on weaving if you're trying this, and I'll be back in a second. Okay, back again. So I did my weaving for about an inch, as you can see there, and then I just wound it off and uh, used a little scrap wire to secure it because we don't actually finish the bale when you're doing this style of bale until the very end. If you are working with um, this style of a frame, um, this is where you will pick up. You'll start by... Um, making three or four turns around the uh, frame wire like this, leaving a tail of about an inch that you can temporarily anchor by giving it a couple of twists around the upper part of your bale. So you do that up around the wraps. Now we're going to cast on our stitches. When you're casting on stitches, it's not that different from the Mandela um, process that we were doing. And once again, I'm working with about a wingspan of wire. So about five feet. And um, I've cleaned it ahead of time. And what I'm going to do now is just work my way around the outer perimeter making stitches. And here is my secret ingredient. One of the keys to getting a really good um, first row of stitches is to have something to pull against. Now you can use, this is actually from a, 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 I can't even remember the name of it, it's a do jig for making coils of wire, but there was a couple of mandrels that came in the set and I tend to use them for this purpose because they're nice and flat on the bottom. A bamboo knitting needle that's cut off would work. I'd say this is about a four millimeter diameter that I've got here right now. And what I do is as I'm getting ready to make the stitch, I um, I use it to brace against. You have to forgive me for a second. I was just getting a kink out of my wire. Bronze is not my favorite thing to use for wire knitting, but that's such a sunny color of a stone. I can't imagine putting it in copper. So here we are. We shall persevere. So I put it right up against the previous stitch. And holding everything together with my fingers, pressing down into my bead mat, and I give my wire a good tug. So now I've got two stitches on. I'm going to show you how I do that a third time, if I can ever find the end. So... I went over, down under, and up over. You can see my loop. I press this in, holding everything steady, and I give it a tug. Pulling down first and then pulling to the right. So now I've got three stitches cast on. And I'm going to continue this process going all the way around till I get to the other side. 
and then I'll show you what happens next. But yeah, the key to getting even stitches is um, having a mandrel. Now, something else that might work as well, um, if you've got a small set of mandrel pliers, you might get away. It's about the, the largest of the heads there is about the same size as that. You might get away with using that. Or like I said, um, a chopstick cut off or a knitting needle, bamboo knitting needle that's just been sawed off and sanded will also do the trick. But having something to brace as you pull keeps your stitches from getting distorted and lets you make them nice and neat. But I'm going to continue this pattern all the way around to this side, and then I'll come back and show you what happens next. Okay, we're back. I've cast on 20 stitches, and I've gone from one side all the way around to the other. For the next, um, for the next part, what I do is going to be a little bit different. Um, and I wanted, this is the only time you really have to worry about this sort of thing, but um, there's always a front and a back to these pendants, um, these cabochon settings. And we are looking at the back right now. So if you were using um, this sort of frame, you would have wanted to start with the, uh, decide which is your front and which is your back and make sure the face is fronting down, um, facing down on your bead mat. What's going to happen now is I'm going to connect this stitch to the other stitch and in essence make my last stitch. So there'll be 20 stitches in total once I do this. And here's where it gets a wee bit tricky. I've put my wire underneath. So the, the pendant frame is facing down again and my long wire is now in front of my, um, in front of what will be my bale. And what I do this time is I'm making my next stitch connect to the first stitch, the first stitch and the last stitch in a row are always um, connected. Now, I usually take this and when I do my pulling, I do it at the front. I think I accidentally have my that wire tangled up in there, don't I? Let me see. Yes, I do. Okay, let's try this again. Real small with feeling. Your mandrel comes in handy sometimes for straightening things out. So I'm going to jam the, my mandrel in there and just give that a little tug. So I've got my first just try to straighten my stitches up. This will be a lot easier when you're doing copper. I will tell you that you might be saying if bronze is so hard to use, why do you use it? Well, sterling silver and bronze have a lot in common. And if you're going to use silver filled wire for your creations, even more so because silver filled wire is really, really stiff. Um, gold filled wire is a lot like copper, very forgiving. Um, so bronze is a base metal. And if you're going to make mistakes, this is the metal to make it in. Don't be making mistakes with your silver filled or your gold filled wires. So practice with bronze and copper. Uh, get proficient with copper, then maybe move into bronze. And once you're comfortable, because there's a lot more wire straightening involved with using bronze than you're going to find with copper. So do keep that in mind. But anyway, the next row of stitches now, I go in between... the first and the second loop. I come at it from behind. This has got to come out of the frame to be pulled, folks, because I've got a long length of wire here. And you'll see in a minute when I get it a little closer to ready. I shall bring it in for its close-up shot. Alrighty then. You'll notice I pulled out the Friendly Neighborhood Tapestry Needle again. There's a reason for that, because um, Again, just like we did with Viking wire knitting, you pull to the left and then you pull to the right and you give it a little nip with your finger. And what you do, if you need to, if you've pulled your stitch too tight, you take your tapestry needle in and give it a little wiggle before you move on to your next one. That one looks pretty good. So I'm going to show you a few of these and then I'm going to do the same thing that I did the last time. 
I go in, I come around and come back out so you can see where that, oops, sorry, wrong end of the camera. You can see where that is located and then I start to pull it through. And yes, it's a tangle of wire, but you know, we wire knitters, we're a little on the um, adventurous side anyway, so nothing we can't handle. If you've ever had cats or dogs run through a pile of, of uh, on-balled yarn, you're prepared for this. <laughs> Again, pull into the right and then pull into the left. Now, what you need to do is you need to go in and give it a little, as you can see, now I've got the beginning of my second layer. Typically what I do is I do the first and second rows of stitches and then working from the back. And then afterwards we'll be holding the cabochon to the frame and working on the front. So I'm going to show you one more of these and then I'm going to turn off the camera, work my way around and uh, show you what we do next. So take the end, go down through, come up like we did before and coax your, oops, <laughs> don't get your wire caught around a camera stand. You notice I, I use my finger. That way when I'm pulling in, I don't get too close um, with, with any kind of a tangle. I always leave myself a little bit of wiggle room. Then I lay it down flat and I pull to the left and then I pull to the right. I go back in, I do a little tweaking, press it down, good to go again. So I want you to keep working your way around, taking your time. When you make your stitch, you're pulling first to the left and then to the right. Um, use your tapestry needle to uh, even anything up that maybe gets pulled too tight. And I'll meet you when once I'm back around to this side again. Okay, we're back. I wanted to try and show you as best I could here now. I've done my second row all the way around and I've gotten up to the top again. So once again, I bring my wire to the front of the frame. This time I'm going to flip over just to show you so you can see it. Okay. And you want to make sure you get your next stitch in the right place because you're going down through this gap here and you're coming up right there. So I'll just try and give you a close up of this. Can you see? You go down through here, but you come up between the first, where you first wound your wire on and uh, the actual bale wires. And then you go through the process of pulling it out of the camera frame because you have a tangle of wire to try and pull through. And again, I like to pull from the back just so I get a decent. All right, so there you have it. You've got the first two rows done and you'll notice I just flipped it around and I've started pulling, sort of pulling it up almost like so it will cup the stone and you'll see what I mean in a second. So what I do now is I take a moment with the frame centered and I start gently pushing stitches so they don't quite lay as flat as they had been. Now, that last stitch didn't lie very flat, but that's okay. Now the next row of knitting, I'm actually going to do holding on to the cabochon. This can get a little bit dicey. It's going to be hard to hold this in the frame too because this bronze wire is extremely springy today. Now usually I'll get a little crook at the end of my wire and here's why. Because now when we're making a stitch it's helpful if we can go right in around. I just use the hooked end to slide right in behind the last stitch. Or did I go into the stitch? I do that sometimes too. Don't pull this off tight until your shirt's in the right place because it's a lot easier to fix it now than later. All right. Again, pull to the left, then pull to the right. 
And now we're going to do it again. If you have to lay it down to straighten out your wire, take the time to do that because kinky wire, kinky wire just doesn't work. <laughs> uh, a little wire knitter's humor there. Oops. At this stage, it'll flop around for a bit, but that's okay. The idea of having it, uh, holding it against the frame is because you want to try and slowly pull your stitches um, so they come up over the edge, and it's a lot easier to do that if you can actually see the edge. This is where the other form of a uh, bale can be a lot easier to do, but um, this one, this style of bale that I, I came up with, um, I actually came up for very practical reasons, which you will see presently. And um, the reason is, is that sometimes I needed to join wire when I first started out because otherwise I was using humongous pieces of wire that were just unwieldy and because I didn't want to have a join. So I decided that my sanity was worth learning how to join wire effectively. And I needed a place where I could do the join. And if I wasn't entirely happy with it, then um, I could camouflage it. So um, the very top of my knitting uh, on a frame like this ends up getting hidden by the way that I do my bale treatment. So it gave me a way to stress less about um, actually having less than perfect wire join. And to join the wire, all I did was anchor it um, to the previous, anchor it between two stitches and carry on, just simply wrapping um, around two or three times and carrying on. And um, it really um, took the stress and the pressure off. And... to the left and then to the right again so you can see we're starting to come up over the edge the reason why we, we I switch usually at the second row is because otherwise you end up with um, your third row tends to spread out even more and then you end up with slack in your setting and that just doesn't do so especially when the frame is fairly small and the stone is fairly small you need a nice snug setting to make sure that it keeps everything where it belongs. Oh my, what a tangle this bronze wire is. So just to let you know that um, the tangling is no less of a problem for those of us who've been doing it for a while. We just uh, swear less. <laughs> but my family would probably tell you that I have my days when my language gets really colorful. So anyway, you get the picture. I'm going to stop this video now and uh, keep working around. And um, remember when you are um, working, when you get to the top now, you're working it in the front so you don't have to pull the wire behind. Perhaps I'll, perhaps I'll um, stop and show you that bit before we carry on. But you just have to keep knitting and pushing up as you go because um, each subsequent row you'll need to bring in a little bit tighter. So anyway, back in a bit. Okay, just quickly um, checking in on this. Uh, quickly checking in on this. Um, I guess oh, row we're on now. This is the uh, third row. Um, or second since we cast on. This time, when I get to the last stitch in the round, I'm just going to jump right over here and wrap around this stitch here. Okay, I just wanted to show you that. And by now, you will notice I've sort of got a little cup happening around the stone. The next two rows are going to come right up over the edge of the, the crown of the cabochon and hold that in place. So now's a good time to start playing with wh which direction you want uh, your stone to be seated in because in a couple of rows from now, uh, it'll be a lot harder to move. Anyway, keep on knitting in the round and I'll see you again shortly. Okay, we've got another row complete, and I just want to show you. As you go, you'll be pulling the stitches snugly, so the distance between each stitch is actually starting to decrease, and that's what makes it stay in the frame. So 
you should be starting to see this effect with your own stone. I also want to let you know that if you're having more difficulties with your wire all of a sudden, it's not you, I promise. All the manipulation that the wire goes through to make this kind of a setting work hardens it. So instead of getting easier, it actually gets a little more challenging to keep the, um, the wire tamed to complete the pendant. Um, but bear with me and uh, take your time. I'm going to do at least one more row, possibly two, and then I'm going to show you how I, I stop off. But keep, keep taking your time, pulling first to the left, then to the right. If you find the end of your wire, your working end is getting too wonky, trim the end off, make a new curve, and uh, use it to go behind each stitch that you need to to create the next row of stitches. I'll be back in a few minutes. And we're back. And I did one, one, two, three, four, five, five rows of knitting beyond the original cast on. And I'm right here at the front and this is where I'm going to stop off the wire. So first I'm going to do is cut the rest of that off because I don't need it. And I'm going to wrap it around just show you close there. I'm going to wrap it a couple of times around the first um, wire between the last and the first stitches. Just do it a couple of times. I think my dog wants back in. I'm going to have to go see to that. But let me see if I can get through this first. One, two, and once more for good measure. I hear you, crackers. Hold on now. Ooh. All right, come down. Now, I'm coming in with my cutters nice and snug. Don't cut the wire. I've done that. It really sucks when it happens, but you don't really want that to happen. And just gently tuck that in under out of the way. Now, if you use this kind of frame, you're basically done. Um, you'll just do a little polishing and uh, get it ready to hang on a chain. If you decided to go with my style of, um, of a bale, there's a couple more things left to do. I'm going to go let my dog in and then I'll be right back. Okay, dog's in the house. We're good to go again for a bit. The first thing I do is I grasp this firmly and I push that down might take a little wiggling but the idea is is I want it to I want there to be about a 90 degree bend between the back of the frame and uh, the two bay of wires and I'm going to tuck that wire back in like that and I guess I better unravel this first shouldn't I because we're going to want to have that wire we may have a little more weaving to do but the idea is now I'm going to create a uh, what I call my signature bale and it's great for hiding places where you join wire and you may have guessed that it's a little challenging sometimes to um, to get a really neat spacing of stitches up near the um, up, up near where the uh, first and last stitches come together right at the top by the bale and um, that's always been a challenge, and I've been at this a long time. So if you found it challenging, don't feel bad. I'm looking at this now and thinking I might want to do a couple of more wraps. Make sure I'm doing this right. It's been a while. I don't do a, a ton of these anymore, and you've probably figured out why, because they're extremely labor-intensive. And um, just like it's difficult for um, fiber knitters to... Um, charge for their time and get a good rate of return for their time. Unfortunately, it can be the same for wire knitting because oftentimes we're competing with a lot of uh, wire working techniques that do not have this kind of labor intensive nature to it. Anyway, the next thing I do is I get my trusty um, wrap and tap pliers and I use the smallest 
bail to get me started and I push it like this. So I've got I've got this kind of thing happening now. Okay. And I put them back in again and this time I want to try and bring that back and forward a bit. So now it looks a little more like that. And I need to continue wrapping down to about here. So I'm going to continue my um, wrap, 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 wrap. I'm going to continue doing this until I have it knit down to here and then I'll show you what comes next. Okay, I have wrapped this and I have um, given it a little tweak. It's important to kind of go in now and, and sort of size this up and to see how straight you are. Because the next thing you're going to do is you're going to push that wire wrapping um, up with your finger and you're going to do that. Oops, you're not going to do that. Crumbs. All right. And as you can see, I just need to push that in a little bit and do a couple of more wraps. Yeah. The next thing I do is I come around and push that together. So now I've got something that looks like this. Now it's starting to look more like the knitted raven signature bale. Ha ha. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to coil wire around this side. And you want to be sure that you get it snug. And I'm just going to do a simple coil around just till it comes out in front of what I'm trying to do here now is to coil so it just comes in front of here because I'm going to do wraps back and forth in a minute. So you do a couple more turns there. And then you actually need to do the same thing on this side so it looks the same. So you don't need a ton of wire, but you want a small length of... Um, 26 gauge or sorry 28 gauge wire or whatever wire you, you were using if you were using 26 gauge copper then obviously you want whatever wire is going to match what you've been using so far now the idea here now is you want to wrap on this side so it comes out just in front of um, the bail loops that you've created so you go on in here Leave yourself a nice long tail to hang on to because you will need to hang on to it. And you just start making loops, coiling around that other bale wire. And you want to tuck them in nice and neat. Use your fingernail to push. We'll straighten all this back up again now in a second because you're using the, uh, the bale wires as leverage so you might take them out of alignment a little bit, but that's okay. That can be fixed after the fact. Now we're getting close. But you want to make sure that when you push it back with your fingernail, you're where you want to be. So That looks good there now. So go in with your wire cutters. Trim that off in the back. Pinch that down with your chain nose. That doesn't want to stay down. Yeah. You'll notice when I push that back in, I've got a little more space than you might think at first here, but that's okay. Now we want to cut the other side off. And again, flatten the, uh, the cut wire against the rest of the bale.
once we get the entire piece finished, we'll go back and make sure that these ends are behaving themselves completely because sometimes they don't want to. So now that I've got that side done, I need to do a couple of more wraps on this side so it matches. How are we doing here? Oh, it's close to even. Maybe one or two more. One. This bronze wire is a lot more springy. All right, now I'm going to nip those together a bit because I actually want them to be close enough together because now guess what I'm going to do? More of the over under weaving that we started with up here. So I come around, push that piece up with your finger because that's just a free bit of coiling that you did. So it may need some persuasion to go back in place. And two wraps around, come down in between, you notice I just splayed those out a little bit, that's on purpose because ultimately that's what we're going to do with those, we're going to put a little curl in them, so you just keep your wire weaving going for a few more turns because this is what prevents this from didn't do two wraps that time. Apparently I can't talk and weave at the same time. <laughs> ah, who knew? All right. I think that's looking pretty good. I just want to go in there. That looked like it had a little bit of a kink in it. There we go. That's better. The tapestry needle is your friend as a wire knitter. So we'll do one more. And going around once, twice, and three times. Now, don't cut your wire yet. Oh, actually, I think I can go a little bit further. My bad. Just gently pull that out. What I like to do with this is I like it to come down so it um, covers that little wonky bit I mentioned before. Hold on now. I really can't talk and weave at the same time. So push things in with your fingernails so they're nice and snug. And then start to holding this firmly push that down. So you've got something going on now that looks a bit like this. And I think I'm down far enough. I'll do one more wrap. One more double wrap. One. Two. One. Two. I think I did three on the other side. Oh dear. One, two. I did. Oh, well, I think I'm going to stop that off there then because that's getting very persnickety. And cut it off there and just wrap that around so it doesn't poke anybody. All right. We're getting close to done. Excuse me. Now the next thing we need to do is, since this is a slightly heavier gauge wire, keep your cutters handy because I want to make little loops here. So I know I've got more than I need. So maybe I'll cut a little bit off of this to start with just to make this a bit easier. And I want to curl them around like so. And I'm going to do that again. And I need to curl that one in a little bit more. Now, 
They're always a little wonky at first, but the idea is, is you want to try putting the right end in, Gafford. Wind that up around so they basically become part of your bail. And press them with your fingers. Sometimes I put this back in here just to hold this while I'm giving it a little bit of a little bit of a push so I don't misshape in it, but there you have it. You now have a um, you now have a uh, wire knit pendant and custom bail. Sometimes you need to lay it down on the bench mat and give it a little bit of a persuading to make it even. But once you got the basic shapes, it's not hard to do. You give that a little nip. And you give that one a little nip. That makes them a little smaller, which is what you kind of want there. A little bit of fine tuning there. But now you have it. There's your pendant bail. And uh, usually what I do is, however I'm going to hang this, I will do that, and then I will make any final adjustments that are necessary um, to the bale for symmetry purposes once I see how it hangs. But that's basically it. You are done. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, this has probably been a test of your endurance as a jewelry maker, but... Um, with a little bit of luck, um, you too uh, will uh, get the hang of this. Practice is what makes perfect. I've done a lot of these and they are still a challenge to me some days, but the results are also worth it. Anyway, if you haven't, give this video a thumbs up uh, and consider subscribing to my channel. It helps me do what I do. Thanks so much for joining me. Talk to you soon.